So I'm hearing a story. I've read this a couple of different ways. This was purported to be a, a true story in the way that I read it. This one about an Anglican uh, minister who was in London. He had a conference up in Scotland. And so he went up to this conference, was coming back, and he flew between Edinburgh and London. And it was not a good flight. Not, not good, it was up and down, there was turbulence, it was not fun. In fact, looking around and there were people looking green everywhere, and just, it was uh, kind of one of those scary ones. I've had a couple of flights like that. Most flights I've been on have been pretty good. I can remember one years ago that we were on that was really turbulent, it must be like that, where it was just up and down, people sick everywhere. And as it got worse, you could see the alarm even starting to grow on people's faces. Um, even the, you know, the, the staff on the plane starting to look a little worried. Until finally one of them came over to this, uh, this Anglican minister. Who's, uh, they didn't give his last name. His name was Michael. And they, they came up to him and said, so... Uh, you know, as I'm looking at the passenger list, I see that you have a reverend in front of your name. And he said, yes. And he said, sir, this is really frightening. Do you suppose, I don't know. I don't know what exactly I'm asking. Can't you do something religious? So he said, so I got up and took an offering. <laughs> Yeah. What do we do when we're troubled and going through troubled times? I read a few minutes ago from Jeremiah chapter 24, in which there is a great promise of God to a people as their lives are collapsing. I, I am talking society wiped out, collapsing. This is the epitome of every possible thing going wrong is happening amongst these people. There are invaders who are coming into the land who are destroying everything and killing huge amounts of the people. Things are falling absolutely into the realm of hopelessness. There's some here who might be in a hopeless situation. I certainly know that there are many who are in our church who have feelings of hopelessness come up. But that's not uncommon in our world. And I certainly know there's many in our midst who life just is not going the direction and the way that they think it should. And we've got a promise of God in the midst of a situation where society itself is collapsing and, and sometimes we want to look at, at a promise of God like we're about to come into or maybe all the promises of God that we'd be looking at through the course of this year and want to say, so what's this really mean to me because I don't see it? I'm not seeing this promise of God in my life. We have this promise of God this week that in spite of disaster, there is hope that the healing of God is coming. And there's going to be a result that because healing is coming to the midst of disaster, you will know that I am God and you can be my people. It is a promise of God that his goal is to bring me healing in all areas of my life so that I might know him as God and that I might come to him with all of my heart. The touch of God is not just something that is possible, it is a promise. And it's coming to a people in complete and utter disaster. And sometimes as we look at the promises of God, I know they don't always feel comforting at this moment. 
I'm not sure as Jeremiah comes to this promise of God that we're about to get to, that it's going to feel good at this moment because it's in amongst a chapter and a couple of chapters are saying, do you know what? Disasters come and it is not going away real quick, but it's taking you somewhere. I always like a promise like that, but within it, there is great hope. So it's off like this. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. The second part to this promise, we'll come to that in a few minutes. To understand this, we need to understand kind of what's going on around this. And as I was reading a few minutes ago, you might have caught all this bit about two baskets of figs. Two baskets of figs. Now, I have this bright idea. Brilliant idea. Do you know what we should do? Just, just to do something different on Sunday morning is, this is a passage about figs. I should see if I can buy some figs. And we can all try a fig as we're talking about fig. That sounds like a great idea. So we have to go through cameras on Friday night, and uh, I raced into a store that, I, and uh, I went to the baking section, see they had some dried figs. Went there, there were. I grabbed them real quick, ran to the uh, the checkout. We paid for them, brought them home. I'm looking at these two packages of figs that I bought and realized they say dates. <laughs> I ran in and bought exactly the wrong thing. Have anybody ever done that before? Please tell me I'm not the only one who would do something like that. Okay, I got one yes. Uh, I walked out exactly with the wrong thing. Anyways, we have some, uh, uh, we do have some dates for after church. Uh, if anybody wants some dates, uh, we turned some of them into squares because we bought a lot of dates. Anyways. Uh, I didn't buy figs anyways, but figs, figs are not something we eat a lot here, are they? They're not part of our regular diet. They don't grow real well. I can't, nothing grows. It's 40 below for a week after week. Anyways, I'm not sure it's ever going to thaw. Figs, however, do feature in a lot of the world quite prominently. In fact, we do find them in the Bible a lot. Uh, Moses comes along, he takes the people out of Egypt. Do you know what one of the first things they do? They start complaining there's no figs out in the desert. Oh man, it was my Sunday school lesson actually this morning that the very first thing they do when the Egyptian, they get out of Egypt, uh, the flood comes over the Red Sea, that wipes out the Egyptians, they start singing and praising God and then immediately start complaining. Go figure. It's kind of human nature, isn't it? Forget immediately all the good things. Just focus on bad. Anyways, this is complaining about figs. We find figs elsewhere. There's a king, a good king. A little bit before a time of Jeremiah, by the name of Hezekiah. He's one of the good guys in the Bible. He's not long before. He's actually during the days of Isaiah, the prophet. He has some painful boils on his body. Isaiah comes along and says, put figs over top of the boils. And he gets better. And I don't know if I generally recommend that as a treatment, but it worked for Hezekiah. Solomon came up. He was actually a little bit before Hezekiah. He compares his young bride in the Song of Solomon, which is an intriguing book of the Bible to read. He comes to that book of the Bible, and he compares his young bride to a fig blooming on the tree. He can even go in the New Testament. There's figs growing, uh, there's a fig tree that's growing, and uh, there's no figs on it, which is kind of predictable because it's not fig growing season, and Jesus curses the fig tree. And there's a whole story behind that. Figs figure prominently in our world. If you want some fig-related trivia, uh, they're considered a sacred plant in India. They are the national tree of Indonesia, and the nation of Barbados was actually named after a type of fig tree. Go figure. Figs are something that much of the world understands. We might not. 
And we go into chapter 23. We go a chapter before what I read. It kind of sets the scene for this parable about the figs. And he talks about two distinct camps that are coming out as the disaster is breaking up in the nation. As the world is coming apart, one group is being led by what are described as religious leaders who lie. Now i got to tell you, whenever I read that, it makes me pause. Because the Bible talks a lot about religious leaders who lie. Now it's not that they're setting out to tell untruths. Here and in many other places, they are people who are reading their own agenda and preferences and opinions into the scripture. They're seeing the Bible in one way, and it's the way they want to see it. And because that is true, they're described as lying religious. Do you know what? Anybody who gets up into a place like where I am needs to be conscious of that. And honestly, and I will include myself in this at some point or another, every one of us is going to blow it. And, and say something that is more what we want scripture to say than what it actually says. And that's why everybody else out here, that's why you should actually read what I say in the Bible and not just take for granted what I say and actually study for yourself and pray about it and understand it because do you know what? That is a real danger. And that's exactly what's happening in their day. The, the lying religious leaders are infecting the politicians, and the politicians are infecting the kind of the, the heavy cultural figures, the important people in their land, and they're all going along and saying, okay, disaster is struck. Here's what God wants of us. Obviously, he doesn't want us here. Go to Egypt. Uh, flee. Run away, because God obviously is not here anymore. Actual fact, Jeremiah is going to come along and say, Don't run away to Egypt, but they don't listen to him. In fact, they kidnap him and drag him off as well. God instead is telling them, Do you know what? Stay here. When the Babylonians drag you off to Babylon, go with them. Yes, it's punishment. Yes, it's a disaster. But I'm taking you somewhere. And in chapter 24, he goes on to talk about this second group that's going to be obedient and go along with this exile. And he says this, Behold, the days are coming. This is a chapter before we're at, so chapter 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days... Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. We find this, same verses in the New Testament, where we're told this branch is very close to the Hebrew word for Nazarene. Well, who's a Nazarene? Yeah, it's Jesus. And we're told very directly this verse is talking about Jesus. So you've got one or two choices. You can go off, run off to Egypt and try to fix a problem for yourself. Or you can go through this punishment, follow, this, follow God. He is sending a Savior who will be your righteousness. Who will become the one who fixes your problem. You can try to fix it yourself. Or you can be obedient. You can follow me. Both sets in this group are in disaster. And neither gets out of the disaster. Neither is able to dig their way out of a mess. Neither is able to fix their problems for themselves. But one finds hope because they're obedient to God. They have faith in God. The other group, not so much. They become the bad figs. So one group becomes the first. Now, I don't know much about growing figs. I certainly do not have a fig tree in my backyard. But they say, I was reading, that there's three 
harvest of figs throughout the course of a year, at least in, in Israel. The first harvest is the best one. Those are, those are the fruits that are the best. Second and third, they're okay, but the first of the year, those are the good fruits. He's saying, you know what? Those who are being, they're like these first fruits. And those who are not, well, I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse. In all the places where I should drive, that is not good. In other words, God's not going to let them get away with this. They aren't going to fix their own problems. But for those who are obedient, the words up on my screen are the key ones, because he's describing, okay, your land is fallen. What am I going to do for you? I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to bring you back to the land. What happens when invaders come through? They knock all the buildings down. I will build them up and not tear them down. What do they do to the crops? They rip them all out. I will plant them and not uproot them. We're going to fix it. I'm going to fix this. You're just going to be along for the ride, but you're going to have to learn some lessons from a long way. And we need to talk a little bit about how healing sometimes works in Jesus. There's a lot of different ways in which God heals us. He can, of course, heal our body. We think of that a lot, right? We often pray for somebody to be healed. In our Sunday school class this morning, I was asking kids about good things that happen, and they all start to bring up, well, so-and-so was sick, and they're better. That's, that can be, that's good. God also heal, can heal our minds. We can have discouragement. Sometimes there's mental illness. Sometimes there's distresses that cause havoc on our minds. He certainly heals our souls, right? Our souls is probably the most important and the first step, and that is bringing us salvation. That is healing. Those aren't the only ways in which he heals. I have seen God heal relationships. I've seen God heal past wounds, things in our past that come up and are a problem in our lives. I've seen God heal unforgiveness, or maybe things that we've learned from the times we were young that are false and are planted deep within our souls. We usually expect healing to be an immediate thing, and often it is. But not always, because some wounds and struggles and some of the things that I've just described, the ways they can heal us, are pretty deep. They are things that have broken our reality. And because the struggles are so deep, God's got to work at a very deep level. That he doesn't come along just to fix all the problems, that he doesn't always just break into reality, our reality, and make everything look the way that we think it should look. This promise that's on the screen behind me took seven decades to get its first fulfillment. They went to exile for seven years. Then, to get the full fulfillment of having Jesus come, it took centuries. And we aren't going to know the fullness of the promise here until eternity. But that does not break the reality of God as at work bringing healing. I want to bring up seven principles about healing. Some things I came, I thought of. Maybe, you, know, you might want to write them down. That's why I put the leave the back of the bulletin for you for writing. Sometimes when there's healing, we need to understand the nature and the depth of the wound. We need to understand how much there is a problem. And particularly when something beyond just the physical. Physical is a little bit different sometimes. We, we should always ask God to heal us physically. Sometimes so there's, there's spiritual wounds, there's relationship wounds, there's, there's things in our, our mind that are broken, and sometimes we need to just start by understanding the nature and the depth of what's wrong. Of having God, asking God to reveal to us, God, why do I have this unease in my life? Why do I struggle to have intimacy with you. Why do I struggle to have intimacy with this person? Or why do I struggle? 
Understand, because sometimes there's something that is going on there that we need to deal with something that's deep. That may not be on the surface, that's farther down. And always prayerfully seek Jesus. Not just ask, God can you come along and fix my problems. Even when it's a physical problem, our healing should not just be about this. It should be, and we're going to see this in the next verse, and we're going to look at a minute, in a few minutes. The next verse is going to say it's all about coming to know Jesus better. That is our goal, is to know Jesus better. So perfectly seek Jesus, because that's our goal. Let's know Jesus. We should always understand that we're on a journey. That this sometimes takes time. And that God is leading us somewhere. And sometimes healing is found in the journey as much as anything. But how often we get frustrated? It doesn't seem to be getting better on my timeline. How do people give up on relationships? Give up on something that's happening in my life? Because it doesn't seem to be getting better. It doesn't feel like it's getting better. They give up on something that God is trying to do in their lives because it's taking too long. We live in an instant society and God is not an instant God. God is a God of eternity. And he is looking at something bigger. And sometimes people, they get frustrated. I get it. I don't feel like I'm getting better. I don't feel like God is healing this wound. I don't feel like God is healing this relationship. And we walk away from it. And as I said, this exile took seven decades. Sometimes it takes decades for God to finish his work, but his work is worth it. So keep seeking Jesus. Keep at it. Keep prayerfully asking God to reveal what needs to happen next. If we think all healing and emotional things and relationship things should happen at a snap of a finger, that we just pray, oh, God's going to fix all our problems. and God's saying, do you know what? There's something deeper in there that i got to deal with. I don't want to just make you feel better. I want to deal. Maybe there's a sin in there. Maybe there's a struggle in there. Maybe there's a wound in there. Maybe there's something wrong deep within, and I've got to deal with it. And just snapping my fingers and making it better isn't going to deal with what's deeper down. But we do work with God to deal with the problem. Now, I do throw out that I should have put actually with God. I was trying to make this all fit on one screen. Because we don't fix the problems ourselves. But that doesn't mean we just sit back and, and just hope that it gets better either. Sometimes, you know, particularly if it's an emotional thing, if it's a relationship thing, there needs to be counseling, there needs to be seeking people to help, there needs to be praying with other people. There's different things we do to let God work. And God does want to work in the deepest parts of our lives. Six, understand eternal life because this is where God's burning is. Be focused on the eternal that all the promises of God are met today, but they're met even more later. And understand this is where God is bringing. God isn't bringing you to a place of just being better so you feel better tomorrow. God is trying to take you towards eternal life where life is going to be in his kingdom it's going to last forever. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more sickness. That's what God's goal for you is. God's goal isn't just making your life comfortable today. God's goal is to prepare you for eternity. And seventh, and this is kind of a repeat, but we kind of have to keep saying it. Always seek Jesus. It's all about Jesus and knowing him. Remember that your journey is unique. Your healing is unique. We don't just sit down and say that this is how it works, that there's, in, follow these steps and everything better. Do you know what? When Jesus goes around and does physical healings in the Bible, 
Over and over again, they are different. They always look different. Why is that? It's to show us that all of our healings are unique, that they're never the same. And sometimes he needs to act in a specific way. It is very possible that at some point in childhood, you, something happens that's traumatic, hurtful, and it might affect relationships later down the line, keep us from intimacy with relationships later. And God might be looking to heal a relationship, but to heal that relationship, he's going to have to deal with something you may not even be aware is bothering you, that you may have forgotten about. And he might be taking you or maybe the other person in the relationship through difficulty to deal with some deeper hurt that is hidden. You know, God let this entire nation of Israel go into exile for seven whole decades. And he did not immediately fix the problem because there were some fundamental flaws that kept them from fully looking at Jesus. That kept them from understanding that they weren't really in charge, that they weren't really in command of their lives, that they couldn't really fix their own problems. Sometimes Jesus needs to deal with some deep issues to make it better. Man, that's heavy. That's a big topic to deal with in a few minutes. I'm going to tell you. But it's one with promise. Because there's this in it. God also doesn't just leave us where we are. God doesn't abandon us in hopeless situations. God takes us somewhere else because he wants an intimate relationship with us. The next verse says this, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their hearts. No, this is the goal. God is love. God is powerful. God is gentle. And full healing is knowing Jesus in these ways. We won't know the fullness of this promise this side of eternity, but we can know it better. And it is coming. And God is at work. And know that when God does work in our lives, he's giving us an indication. When there is a healing, whether it be physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, in relationship, whatever it needs to happen, whenever we catch God working in our lives, it is to give us a taste of eternity. It is showing us what is possible and where he's going. That God is taking us somewhere, and to do that, he needs to remove the barriers that stand between him and us. We may not always like it, but he is bringing us to his strength. You think of, think, think of the New Testament. There's this guy in the New Testament. You probably heard of him. His name is Peter. Disciple of Jesus. He is, in the Gospels, the hotshot disciple. He's the one who's close to Jesus. He's the one who everybody looks up to as leader. And his self-image is on Jesus' favor. Look how good I am. I follow Jesus. I'm good with Jesus. I am. The one everybody looks up to. Look how important I am. That's his self-image. Jesus brings the disciples together on the night that he's betrayed. You probably know the story. He's going to look over at Peter, who in the midst of saying, you know, Jesus in the midst of saying, you know, you're all going to fall. Peter says, oh, Jesus, look at me. I'm not going. Of course, Jesus looks at him and says, yeah, you are. And you look at what goes on that night. They go out to pray in the garden. What does Peter do? He's falling asleep. They come along to arrest him. Peter, one jumps out, he's going to fight the whole Roman Empire. 
pulls out his sword, cuts off the, the servant's ear. Jesus heals it, says, Peter, put your sword away. Really? Come on. They drag him off. Peter and John follow behind at a little bit of a distance. Three times that night, somebody says, hey, you just know Jesus, don't you? Three times, not a chance. One of them to a servant girl who has no authority. Now all of a sudden, what's Peter's self-image? I am a failure. I failed Jesus. He had to be broken, but that's not where he's left. Jesus rise from the dead, they go up to Galilee, they go fishing one night, aren't catching anything. Uh, voice yells from the shore, hey, caught anything? They yell back, no! Try the other side of the boat. They do, they catch a whole bunch of fish, they realize Jesus. Peter jumps over the side of the boat, he swims to shore, Jesus made a breakfast. Then they go for a little walk, and three times, Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? And three times Peter says, yes! Of course I love you. Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus answers, feed my sheep. The last one, Peter, we're told, is hurt. Don't you believe me? Don't you believe me? Do you know what Jesus is doing here? He's, he's building his self-image. He's gone from hot shot to failure, and now he's trying to bring him somewhere where he needs to be. It's hard. I mean, you, you look at this conversation. Uh, Jesus starts telling Peter, Peter, you're gonna, you're, you, you will go on, you'll follow me, but you're going to end up dying a pretty bad death. You're going to go to hard places. Things are not going to go right. Peter looks over, he sees John walking by, and he says to Jesus, well, what about that guy? It's a classic defense mechanism, isn't it? Turn our attention to somebody else. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're not talking about John, we're talking about you. He doesn't get pulled into this. We're talking about you. Peter needs to be healed. He doesn't even know it, but he needs it. And what's the result? This conversation about Jesus driving <clears throat> Peter to love and then to understanding, feed my sheep, that he has a role to play in his kingdom. You know, Peter doesn't even realize he needs to, he doesn't know what to pray for, he doesn't even know what's wrong. Until the death of Jesus. I read the earlier from Isaiah 53. By his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Jesus did not die to fix things superficially. He came to make you right with your creator at the deepest levels. He was willing to pay a very difficult price, and his goal is to bring you complete and full healing. Why? So that you may know him fully. So that the glory of God might shine through you. And God has a plan for you, and it is glorious. And we need to walk in faith in what he is doing. We're going to take some time to sing of that God. Um, I was told that our pianist would have to sneak off before the sermon was done. So we're going to sing this to recorded music, and uh, so I'm going to invite our worship team to come forward. We're going to sing hymn number 29, To God Be the Glory. 